Popple. Um, our first talk is going to be given by Azalea, who will tell us about what to do when your libraries need to have some weak memory in them. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the introduction. You stole my joke. I was going to say, welcome to the Victor Raphael this weak memory session, but he already did that. So let me tell you about the fun part, uh, the concurrent library specification. So as many of you know, a concurrent library specification has been a hot research topic for at least the last couple of decades. And when we turn to the literature, in the idealized concurrency model known as sequential consistency, or SC, there has been a lot of work. We have the semantic-based notion of correctness of linearizability. We also have several concurrent program logics for specifying concurrent libraries. Unfortunately, when we turn to the more realistic notion of concurrency, um, more realistic models collectively known as weak memory con consistency, the situation is a little bit different. What we have done so far, we have taken existing approaches from the SC world, such as linearizability and program logics, and tweaked them and adapted them to fit a particular weak memory scenario. But the problem is that each of these approaches are tuned and customized for a particular weak memory model. They tie to a particular memory model. And as a result, every time a new memory model comes along, we will have to go back and revisit those uh, notions and just readjust them to the, to the next weak memory model. For instance, to give you some examples, we have program logics that allow us to reason about the release acquire fragment of C11 or the TSO memory model. But what we would like, ideally, is a generalized framework that is completely memory model agnostic and would allow us to reason about, specify, and verify concurrent libraries. In particular, here is our wish list. We want a generalized framework that is agnostic to the memory model and supports both SC and weak memory concurrency. But we also want this framework to be general in a sense that we don't want to have to redo any of the work we've already done. We want to take existing SC or weak memory specifications and port them directly into our framework. But more importantly, we want this framework to be built from the ground up in a sense that we don't want to assume any pre-existing libraries or specifications. And finally, we want to be able to support compositionality. And by that, I, I mean that we want to support a compositional client verification, where, for instance, I have a program like this that is calling the operations of the queue library and the stack library, and say I want to, at the end, say that this operation always returns one. But I also want to be able to verify implementations of concurrent libraries in the same framework. And this would allow me to build layers of abstraction in the same framework. For instance, if I could port the specification of C11 into my library and specify a mutex library in the framework, then I could just implement a mutex using C11 and also hopefully verify its implementation against that spec. And once again, I could take my mutex and C11 and implement a Q library and verify that against its specification and so on. Now, you might think that, okay, these are all very nice properties to have. Sure, I'm on board. But rather than inventing a framework from scratch, why don't you take an existing approach such as linearizability, which is very well known, and adapt that to have all these properties? And to answer that question, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction and reminder of what linearizability is, and hopefully convince you that that's not the way to go. So here's the definition of linearizability. For a library to be linearizable, for all of its uh, client programs, and all of their executions, you need to show that certain things hold. So here is a particular execution of a client, uh, of a client program of the Q library with two threads. The thread one is NQ in value one, and then NQ, NQ in value two, and the second thread is calling DQ and returning one. Now, to figure out whether or not this is linearizable, first I need to define something called the happens before relation. And the standard way of defining that is using real-time ordering. So I would say an event happens before another if the first one ends in real-time before the second one starts. So in this example, A ends before B starts, so they're HP related. But A and, B or A and C overlap in the sense that A ends after C is already started, so they're not HP related. And once I have this happens before relation, then I would say, OK, this is linearizable. If you find a total order, a sequential execution, a total order that one respects this happens before relation, and two forms a legal sequence. Now, what the definition of legal sequence is, is completely dependent on the library. For instance, in the case of the queue, you would say that you need to have a FIFO sequence. So in this example, one possible sequence is this ABC that respects the A who happens before B constraint and forms a FIFO sequence. Because if I NQ1 and NQ2 and call DQ, I should return 1 under FIFO. Now, why is non-linearizability suitable for us? 
The first answer is that it assumes it requires this real-time order, which is not very realistic. But more importantly, it requires the existence of this total execution order. And that's definitely not always possible under weak memory models. And to understand this, I'm going to show you this uh, litmus test known as the store buffering behavior that is present in all weak memory models. So here I have two threads. The first one writes to x and reads from y, and the second one writes to y and reads from x. And these annotations are basically denoting the value that's read. So here I'm saying when reading from y, I read 0, and when reading from x, I'm reading 0. Now this annotated behavior, it's not, it is not linearizable. So to see that, let me remind you that under linearizability, all events are totally ordered. So I know that these two writes are ordered one way or another. So either A is executed before C or vice versa. Now, if A is executed first, by the time I get to read this X after Y, this our right to X has already happened, so I shouldn't be able to observe zero for X. And conversely, if C is executed before A, by the time I read from Y, this write has already been executed, so as a result, I should be reading one and not zero. So this is not a linearizable behavior. And like I said, this behavior is supported by all existing weak memory models. So this total execution order is very restricted. Now you might say, okay, a lot of times when we move from the SC to the weak memory world, we relax our conditions and say, okay, rather than a global property, we require something per location. So why don't we say a per location linearizability? And the answer to that is because of libraries such as C11. For instance, take the C11 fences. They put ordering constraints across multiple locations and not a single location. And if I were to require per location linearizability, then I wouldn't be able to specify those. And if you remember, I said that I want to be able to build everything from the ground up. In particular, I want to be able to port the C11 specification, and I couldn't do that. So instead, in our solution, we have this generalized framework that is memory model agnostic, doesn't require the real-time order, doesn't require the total order, and we still manage to give this compositional per library specification. And the way we do it is very similar to existing declarative approaches for weak memory. So we specify a library as a set of executions that satisfy certain axioms. So let me give you an example. Here's the client program that I showed you from earlier, so in more detail. It's calling the queue and stack operations. And here, when I call this DQ, either it's executed after the NQ has happened, so it could return one, or it's executed before the NQ has happened, so it may return empty, that I will show by bottom. Now, I said that I want to give a pair library specification, so for now I'm going to focus on the Q part of this execution, and that's why I have given this Q calls in boldface. So let's look at the execution of this library and let's say what it looks like. So an execution is going to have multiple components. It's a graph, and I'm going to go through these components now. The first component is the events of the execution. And basically, you have one event per core. So I have one event for new queue, one event for NQ, and so on. And since the DQ may return one or bottom, I'm going to have two, execution, two executions, one in which I have one, one in which I have empty. The next component is the program order. Most of you will know it. This is basically sequential composition in each of your threads. The one after that is the synchronization order. And intuitively, at least for this talk, it's relating matching NQ and DQ events. So for instance, when I NQ1 and then call DQ and return 1, this DQ is reading from that NQ, so it's synchronizing with it. Whereas in this other example, when I return empty, no synchronization is happening. And this last component is the happens before relation that I'll come back to in just a moment. Now, if you look at our example a little more closely, you will see that this DQ happens only when the conditional holds. And the conditional holds when you pop to, i.e. you read and observe the value pushed by this first thread. So if you observe this, you should also observe the earlier NQ. So you shouldn't be allowed to return empty. For those of you in the weak memory world, this is basically the message passing idiom translated to the library setting. So I want to eliminate this bad behavior. But the reason I'm not allowed to read empty here is because of the synchronization that's going on between the stack operation, between the push and the pop. So focusing just on the queue execution, I won't be able to capture that. So as a result, I'm going to look at the bigger execution of the entire program and see how I can uh, stop this bad behavior. So here it is. Now I'm going to describe the executions of a program, not just a library. And the execution of a program is very similar to library executions, and we have similar components. So back to our example, this example from before, execution graphs are very similar, except that this time, as well as these queue events, I also have the stack events in both of the executions, with the POHs in between. 
And let me put in the SO, which is like I said, SO relates matching events. So I have the SO between the NQ and BQ as before, but also this push and pop synchronized because this one is reading from that one in both of the executions. Now intuitively, I said the reason why I'm not allowed to read empty in this execution is because there is this path from here to here that I say, okay, you synchronize here and you're observing the earlier NQ. And to capture that, I'm going to define this global notion of happens before relation over the entire execution as the transitive closure of the PO and SO together. So in both of these executions, I have this PO, SO, PO path from the NQ to DQ, so I end up with a happens before edge between them. Now I can say, because there is a happens before edge from here to here, you shouldn't be allowed to read empty. But the question is how? I did say that I want these per library specifications, and this happens before relation is defined over the entire execution, and I want to just focus on the Q part. So to, under, uh, to understand this, I'm going to tell you how, given a big program execution, we're going to project it down to, say, the Q part. So here is one of our executions from before, and if you look at its components, especially the events, you will see the events are the Q events highlighted blue and the stack events highlighted red. So intuitively, it should be possible for me to also project the graph down to the Q part and the stack part. And this is what I'm going to do for the Q part. So to project it to the Q part, I'm going to just take the blue events and ignore the red events. And I will do the same thing for the PO part. I'm going to say only consider the PO edges that are between the Q events. And similarly for SO, only consider the SO edges that are between blue events. For instance, ignore this SO between the stack events. Now, from earlier, I said that there is an extra component in the library executions that I'm going to come back earlier, and that was the happens before relation. And the question is, what am I going to pass to the library as it happens before? And I'm sure you've guessed correctly that what I'm going to do is take this global happens before, defined over the entire execution, and again, restrict it to the Q part. So here I have this happens before, and it's between blue events, so I'm going to uh, include that in my projection. So going back to my example, this was my program executions, and now I'm going to project it to the Q part and obtain these two graphs. And as a result, I now have this happens before as part of my library execution, and I can say you shouldn't be allowed to return empty. But so far, I haven't told you anything about how. This was just intuitive discussion. At the beginning, I did say that execution, uh, the specification of, of a library is a bunch of executions that satisfy certain axioms. And here is where those axioms are going to come in and exclude this right-hand behavior. So let's look at our Q axioms. So we say that an execution, a library execution, is the Q, consistent Q execution if and only if it satisfies certain axioms. And here are the axioms. The first one says that, very straightforwardly, your events should be Q events. No surprises there. The second one is what I've been saying all along, that your synchronization should relate matching NQ and DQ events. So whenever you have an SOH between NQ and DQ, they should have the same value. And of course, a DQ that returns empty shouldn't synchronize with anything. And finally, synchronization needs to be one-to-one -one in a sense that each NQ is DQ that most wants and vice versa. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, I'm going to say that there needs to exist a total execution order total order on all events, that one, respects the happens before relation, and two, forms a FIFO sequence. Now, I'm sure this sounds familiar to all of you. This is basically the linearizability definition I had from earlier for the queues. And this is exactly why I've given you this example here. I wanted to show you that the framework doesn't need to necessarily require this total execution order because we want to support weaker behaviors. But whenever you need stronger guarantees, for instance, for the Q, you can encode it as an extra axiom here. And this is what we have done. And this is my Q specification. So going back to my earlier executions, this was the good example. I'm going to project it to the Q part. Now I need to find the total order that respects HP. All events are already ordered by HP, so this is my execution candidate. And it forms a FIFO sequence. I'm done. Whereas for the other one, again, there is only one kind of total execution, but this one is not a FIFO sequence. Because if I NQ1 and then I call DQ, I shouldn't return empty on the FIFO. So this was just to give you a glimpse of how we specify things in our, library, in our framework. And we have many examples in the paper of queues, stacks, locks, exchanges, and so on. But then we started at some point verifying implementations against their specifications. Like I said, that's another thing we want to do in our framework. And in particular, we realized that we don't really like this strong queue specification, and for two reasons. 
The first reason is that this, uh, this specification is too strong, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And the second reason is that it's very difficult to find, it says there exists a total order, so you have to conjure up this total order out of nowhere. And in the worst case, you might have to enumerate all possibilities and check them one by one. So tell you why, uh, to show you why it's too strong, I'll tell you a story. So we were trying to verify this Helihue wing implementation of the queues on the release acquire fragment. This is basically Helihue wing adapted to release acquire. And all you need to know about release acquire fragment is that whenever I have a release write and an acquire read that reads from it, they end up synchronizing. And from the queue world, you will remember that the NQ and DQ of matching uh, values will be synchronizing. So we thought quite intuitively that for this to capture the synchronization, we will have to make all the writes in NQ release and all the reads in DQ acquire. And we were convinced that this is correct. And after days and days of labor, I, we discovered that this is actually not correct. It doesn't satisfy the strong queue specification. And the minimal counterexample, it's minimal, we have a proof, requires four, at least four threads with two Q instructions each. So it wasn't obvious why it's breaking that property. So to remedy that, we decided to weaken these axioms and come up with a no, weaker notion of correctness for Qs. I'm, I don't have the time to show you these weaker axioms, but in case you're wondering why these weak Q axioms, let me tell you that in some cases, okay, the strong Q specification is lovely. But in some cases, it's too strong in a sense that it's giving you guarantees that you don't necessarily need all the time. For instance, if you're using your queue as a buffer in the single producer, single consumer paradigm, then our specification is more than enough. Now, so I said we don't like that specification because it's too strong, so we moved on to the weak axioms, but we also didn't like it because of this existential quantification. So what we have done in our paper, we have come up with an equivalent strong specification that doesn't require this TO uh, to total order execution, and instead has captured the same thing using an acyclicity axiom. So we say if so-and-so cycles are missing from your graph, then you have a strong Q specification. And with that, uh, I'd like to summarize and conclude. So uh, hopefully I, I have presented you a framework and convinced you that it is indeed memory model agnostic. It's general, it supports both SC and weak memory specifications, and it is built from the ground up. What I didn't manage to show you was examples of compositionality, and we have lots of those in our paper. So this diagram that I've been hinting at all along includes all our examples in the paper. In particular, we have supported this 11 specification, we have specified and verified all these other libraries that you see, and in some cases, multiple versions of them, like the Helihue Wing Queue, the Read Alike Locks, and so on. And that's all I have to say, so thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? So great work. Can you say a little bit, how do you verify these library implementations? Are they written in C or some code and how? So basically this diagram that you can see, so the mutex is implemented in C11, uh -huh. the, Q, the locking queue is implemented using the mutex library and the C11 and so on. Then we have built a weak stack and exchangers. And so the foundation is C11 and then we have built things on top of it. And the way we have verified, we have uh, mechanized the meta theory in Koch. We have this compositionality theorem that makes the proofs very straightforward. You, do, you, do you prove some type of a contextual refinement? It's basically a refinement proof, yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, why do you care so much about PO? It seems that your happens before relation prevents reordering instructions within a single thread. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. So you, the happens before relation mm -hmm. um, includes the program order, mm -hmm. and it seems to prevent reordering instructions within a single thread. Isn't so, it a limitation? So we have defined, so it all depends on the, I mean, give you an example, um, with all the memory models that we have, in some of them, including C11 or the weaker architectures, reordering is allowed, but this doesn't stop us from uh, capturing that reordering. We have defined this happens before relation. It's the axioms that will put extra conditions on happens before. We're not saying anything about the happens before. We pass this happens before, project it down to the library, and then it's up to the specification to put conditions on this happens before. We're not requiring, we're not putting any constraints on the happens before.
So in general, these library axiomatizations might be arbitrarily complicated, right? but and that I can imagine will be difficult for programmers to think of. But in practice, they're probably very often, you know, these calls are release acquire semantics calls or something else that could be said in a quite small language. So are you saying that these specifications are often not too complex or are too complex? No, I'm asking you, of what kind are they? So, okay, so uh, in our experience, so whenever we ported existing linearizability style like specifications, it was straightforward. The strong specifications, you basically translate them into this framework. But we did realize that some of them are indeed too strong. And there is this lovely blog uh, by Neil Shabit that argues for weaker and weaker specifications. They might be a bit less intuitive. <coughs> Uh, but I think it is our job to educate the programmers that sometimes it is good to sacrifice a little bit of uh, intuition for a much better performance. So it depends on where in that level of weakness you want to be. You can go weaker and be more efficient. But um, I mean, I do like our weak uh, specification because it is quite intuitive. It's very similar to the strong one, but it doesn't have this global FIFO guarantee. It has a local FIFO guarantee. So can you say something about the compositionality of this uh, notion of linearizability or like correctness? I mean, uh, when I'm using two objects, like you had an example, whether I can say something about their composition or? Uh, so so um, I think if I understand the question correctly, there are two th things about compositionality. One is how is it, is, is it to prove an implementation that is correct with respect to, an implement, uh, to a specification? And there we have a compositionality theorem that says you only have to focus on the library that you're proving, not the bigger context. But as for the specification of a bigger client program that's using a stack or the uh, queue in the example that you were saying, I think that we don't have a compositionality result in that sense, but it's, I mean, I didn't have the time to show you the example, but it's very easy to reason about the client programs just by looking at the executions and say so-and-so behavior does or does not happen. I, I can show you an example offline, maybe. Okay,